From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Phones have been ringing off the hook at Oregon Senator Ron Wyden's office with small business owners wanting federal relief, health care providers and hospitals wanting more PPE and testing, and Oregonians frustrated they can't get through to the state employment department to file their unemployment claims. Senator Wyden joins us to tell us what help is on the way. And later, the head of Oregon's Department of Education, Colt Gill, will be here. We'll find out how distance learning is going for students and teachers, when school might reopen. And we'll ask why students can't have the option for letter grades rather than simply a pass or incomplete. First, welcome to my guest, Oregon's senior Senator Ron Wyden, talking to us from Washington, D.C. Senator Wyden, thanks for joining us. It's good to see you, even though it's remotely. Tell us where you are and, and how you're doing. Laurel, I'm doing fine, and I'm sitting at my desk in the Senate Dirksen office building, and I have basically been here every single day for weeks on end with only a short time out to zoom in on a couple of Passover seders. And the reason I'm sitting here at this desk is I felt this was where I could do the most good for Oregonians, because we know, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, a lot of folks are hurting. And so we're sitting here just pushing to make sure that Oregonians can get those benefits that Congress intended. Well, let's talk about some of the help available because people are hurting and struggling. We are taping this on Thursday afternoon and earlier this week, the Senate passed another nearly $500 billion relief package. As we speak, the House is finishing up voting. We expect them to pass it and the president to sign it. What will it mean for Oregon businesses, hospitals and for testing, Senator? My real hope, of course, is that this money will finally get to the small businesses. The major program, the Paycheck Protection Program, seemed to get the money out to the big guys like Ruth Chris, but didn't get to the small businesses. So the focus now is on making sure the dollars really get to small businesses in the major uh, program. I also think that in the days ahead, Oregon small businesses will benefit more from a program that came about uh, through my authoring it called the Employee Retention Act, which offers refundable tax credits for employers. Those two things, I think, provide some real hope for small businesses going forward after these first days have left them understandably massively frustrated. You are the ranking Democrat on the Senate Finance Committee, and coincidentally, you and your staff had been working on an overhaul of the unemployment program before the pandemic hit. Help us understand what you were able to get into that earlier two plus trillion dollar package. What we got into it was essentially bringing the program into the modern uh, days. The unemployment law was written in the 1930s and nobody had ever heard of a gig worker back in the 1930s. So Laurel, I was able to add uh, the self-employed, the independent contractor, the part-timer. Those people are going to get full unemployment uh, benefits and the $600 extra per week, each week for the next four months. Now, when you write the law in Washington, DC, you still have to look at how it's administered. And it has been administered by each state. And of course, there has been incredible uh, frustration again by so many folks who have been trying to get through to the unemployment office. I've been pushing the Federal Department of Labor under Eugene F. Scalia to do more to help the states get the checks out the one other point that I wanna mention for Oregonians is that these payments are retroactive. So I know that people are trying to figure out how to get through. I also want them to know that the payments are retroactive. So people who have earned these benefits are gonna get them. And the total for Oregon 
will be about $3.3 billion. I, I want to follow up on that because I know you've gotten a lot of calls. I've gotten a lot of calls. We have here at the station with people so frustrated trying to get through to the Oregon Employment Department. They say it's a full time job trying to call them. They've called hundreds of times a day. They can't get any answer online. Uh, the state blames an antiquated computer system. Is there anything you can do to help in that area? Yes, and what I've been doing is pushing the Federal Department of Labor to do more to help the states with these uh, outdated technologies. For example, I was able to secure a billion dollars of money to go to the states to update their systems. But the fact is they are very outdated, one, and across the country with the new numbers today, we're talking about well over 25 million people flooding these offices. That is a staggering amount. It went up uh, many millions just in the last uh, week. So this is going to be an administrative challenge. One of the governors I saw on TV a couple of nights ago, not, uh, not Kate Brown, but was adver asking for COBOL programmers to help at the unemployment office, COBOL programming came about 60 years ago. Well, we certainly need the help, judging from all the, the calls we're getting. I want to ask you about vote by mail. This is something that you've been pushing a, a nationwide system for years now, but it seems like the pandemic has now given it some new energy. We saw what happened earlier this month in Wisconsin's primary with long lines, uneven protective measures, shuttered polling places. You've introduced a bill now for a nationwide vote by mail system to try to make the, the vote safer in November. Where does that stand? And do you think you can get Republicans on board because many of them are wary about a vote by mail system. It is time to COVID proof American elections and Oregon's vote by mail system provides a pretty good roadmap to go about uh, doing it. We've had it for many years. I was Oregon's uh, first uh, senator to be elected by mail, but our second senator was Gordon Smith, who was a Republican. And so the evidence shows that it really doesn't favor one political party or another. What the real question uh, is, is are we gonna recognize the danger that we face right now? I mean, we saw that in Wisconsin. We'll never put Oregonians at risk that way, where they're standing in a line in a pandemic a older voter who is particularly susceptible there walks up to the uh, voting booth and is met by a poll worker who by uh, most calculations is over 60. Most of the poll workers in America are over the age of 60. Older voters plus older poll workers is a prescription for trouble. And fortunately, Oregon has laid out a roadmap to avoid that. Senator, we're seeing protests uh, against stay at home orders in a number of states. We're expecting some here in Oregon on May 1st and May 2nd. They say they want the restrictions lifted. They want to have their jobs back. They say it's an overreach to order people to stay at home. When do you think that restrictions should be lifted? Let me kind of outline my views on, on this. I mean, the governor under the Constitution has the responsibility to make public health judgments and the governor's got a good team of public health uh, professionals advising her. And I expect that what they're going to do is work to get Oregonians back to their lives as quickly as possible while keeping Oregonians safe. And if there is less danger in the rural areas, I hope they will have the opportunity to end the most restrictive measures sooner than in areas where there is more danger. So clearly what you need to do is really think through what some of the challenges uh, are. And those are the principles that I think we ought to look to. And as I say, under the constitution, the governor has the responsibility to make public health judgments. 
Senator, there are people without homes, without permanent addresses, without bank accounts. How can, and how can they get access to some of these benefits? That's a, another really important uh, point because we have jurisdiction on the Finance Committee over a lot of these uh, payment programs. And I have asked the Treasury Secretary, Mr. Mnuchin, to really push a very aggressive uh, effort to reach out to people who don't have traditional banking services and uh, they're entitled, but they're harder to reach than people who have um, direct deposit. And these benefits and housing, because we've got a significant uh, homeless problem, these are basic human rights. And one of the reasons I'm sitting at this desk today is I'm gonna stay at it until those benefits get into the hands of those who are the most vulnerable and make sure that they're cared for amidst a crisis. This money and benefits are so important to people and needed right now, but we're talking $6 trillion plus, an astronomical amount of money added on top of $23 trillion we already have as a national debt. What do you think this means down the road? Are there going to have to be some hard decisions made, uh, massive tax increases eventually? Laurel, I'm, I'm one who says that when you look at economics, you've got to look at the immediate uh, challenge. I mean, one of the reasons I pushed so hard for those unemployment benefits is not only do they go to pay for rent and groceries, they're also critically important uh, because uh, they generate the demand. They're out there um, basically replacing, you know, demand for goods and services because people have money in their uh, pockets and they can go and make the purchases. So it seems to me you focus on the immediate. It was wage replacement. It was demand replacement. That's immediate because when people go out and buy those goods and services, then um, employers can retain employees. I do think for the longer term, we're going to have to um, make sure that uh, we look to ways to pay this money back. And right now we're dealing with an immediate crisis, but I'm not one who says you can just ignore the fact that it'll have to be paid back. We only have about 45 seconds left, Senator, but do you have a final message that you'd like to send to Oregonians during this pandemic? I do, and it's one of gratitude. The fact that we have lower infection rates than many areas, lower deaths, comes about because a lot of Oregonians stepped up. And you've heard me call it the Oregon way, when Oregonians say, we've got to work together. It's not about Democrats and Republicans. The reason that we produce those results that are far better than a lot of other states is because Oregonians worked uh, together I want them to know that as their senator, I'm very proud of them and I'm gonna do everything I can to back them up. Senator Wyden, thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk. Stay safe, fair, good luck, and thanks for your work there in DC on behalf of Oregonians. And coming up next, the top guy at Oregon's Department of Education joins us next. Director Colt Gill will be here to answer questions about distance learning, student grading, the governor's plan for eventually reopening schools and a lot more. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Oregon students are ending this school year at home without their classmates. The coronavirus pandemic has forced schools to move to distance learning statewide. How's that going? And what's the plan for the future? We find out from the director of the Oregon Department of Education, Colt Gill. Director Gill, thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. The Oregon Department of Education moved to distance learning on April 13th. So it's been almost two weeks and, and this is the guidance sent out. It's quite lengthy, but how do you think it's going so far? You know, that um, guidance is getting lengthier each week. Actually, we keep adding to it. Um, you know, we're asking a lot of our students, our families, um, and our educators right now, and people are really coming through in some powerful ways. We're consistently hearing from students, from educators, from parents, 
um, about how things are going at home, both the challenges and the successes. Um, I have meetings uh, one or two times a week with all the superintendents in, in school districts in Oregon, and I get to hear specific highlights and, and um, some of the successes and some of the challenges that they're facing. We work together on those um, challenges to try to uh, develop some collaboration and some efforts to overcome them. You know, some school districts are really stepping up in creative ways. Springfield School District recently just deployed uh, 12 school buses with Wi-Fi access um, to take them into communities where families don't have internet connection at home. Baker School District over in Eastern Oregon is delivering Wi-Fi hotspots directly to um, students uh, in families without internet connection. Um, there's a great uh, connection to uh, community business in Oregon. So Ray's Food Place is in a number of communities here in our state. And they are offering to turn their Wi-Fi on in their stores out into their parking lots to allow students to um, come in and uh, access their homework or their education from their school. So those are the kinds of things that we have going on across the state. You know, this is a state with um, really industrious, creative, and caring people um, who really know how to come together and make things happen for our kids in a time there, like this. There is some thought nationwide that the pandemic is going to exacerbate the, the achievement gap, the academic achievement gap between middle and low income, white students, students of color, urban versus rural. How are you specifically trying to address that? You know, that's a really good point. Um, Oregon has a lot of rural school districts. So we have 197 school districts altogether, and the majority of them are small rural districts. About half of them have fewer than 500 students. And in Oregon, we actually have 15 districts that have fewer than 10 students that we serve. Um, these districts, while they're small, are also some of the greatest assets for these local uh, or small Oregon rural communities. Um, each of them have their own unique strengths and challenges. Um, but the digital divide is real. Um, we have real uh, issues with trying to get broadband internet service into some of the communities in Oregon and even cell phone service. If you've driven across the state of Oregon, you've probably run into that problem. You know, some of the districts are overcoming that by delivering paper packets or flash drives with um, information from the teacher. And then the teacher actually calls the student and walks through that information with them and provides a lesson. And then the students have time to independently work. I, I sent some pictures from Paisley School District. That's a school district with about um, 215 students in a small community off Highway 31, um, northeast of Klamath Falls. And you know, there's proof that it can happen. Um, students working from home, uh, turning in work to their teachers, getting evalua evaluation and feedback, and then um, doing more on their own. It's really a powerful story. Uh, Director Gill, in the second phase of Governor Brown's a draft plan to reopen the economy, in the second phase, she mentions schools reopening. Do you foresee the possibility that schools could reopen in part for some students this summer? Yeah, uh, this summer, um, it, it will depend on that, on that plan that the governor put forward. So that plan um, requires a few things. So it requires that a community meets certain criteria. Uh, and that's criteria around the metrics um, of COVID-19 outbreaks, um, preparedness so that the community is actually ready to handle um, increased cases if they happen, and then phasing in. And you're right. So the um, first phase, schools do not open. But in the second phase, schools can open with physical or social distancing. Um, and so we're working with uh, the Oregon Health Authority and other health experts and our district officials um, to be able to think about what a thoughtful, safe, and deliberate um, opening of schools looks like. And I think that in some counties uh, where we haven't had many cases, as long as they have the criteria, that criteria in place and preparedness, and we could be moving towards that kind of an outcome um, in the summer, and I certainly hope for the fall, but it really all depends on the, on the outbreak. Um, really, the disease is setting the timeline for us. We're not setting that timeline. What students would be able, depending on what uh, districts, what students would be able to go to summer school? So summer school in Oregon is really a district by district decision, um, and it's funded um, by school districts. They uh, can use, sometimes they use funding from federal sources, sometimes from state sources. Uh, but but it's a local decision and those are open to um, the students that they invite. So this year, 
um, because we've had students miss so much in-person school time. Um, you know, I, I know that school districts would like to make school available to many students if they have the resources to do that. We also have had a few school districts talk about reopening early. So hopefully that can happen. We've heard from a, a number of students and parents who aren't happy about the state's decision that high schoolers won't be getting letter grades for this semester. Rather, they will be getting pass or incomplete. They want the option to choose to receive a letter grade. And I want to read you a letter that, that we got from a student. This is from Ryder Harris. He's a sophomore at Beaverton High School. And he says, we're concerned because we're taking advanced placement classes this year, which provide a boost to your GPA. This allows you to get above a 4.0, which looks very good on a college application. This semester, I was slated to raise my GPA to around a 4.3. I will no longer get this opportunity because all grades are being disregarded for this semester. This will therefore cheat us out of several potential points towards our GPA, meaning that we could potentially be passed over in college admissions in favor of another student who is allowed to use an A to F grading as other some other states are doing. And Ryder says he and others have tried to contact your department and they get an automated reply and they don't feel like you're listening to them. What can you say to Ryder? Uh, why can't they have the option to choose a letter grade? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to visit about that. And I actually have um, read writer Harris's email and have responded to it personally. Now, they a lot of folks that have written in are receiving a lot of the same information um, because the question is the same. Uh, but I'll tell you what we're doing is we've taken an approach in Oregon to preserve student accomplishments and really try to center in equity. And it, by doing that, we're trying to ensure that no student is penalized for something outside of their control. So with input and agreement from our educators in Oregon, um, from community partners and others, we've shifted our final term to a pass-in-complete um, grading system. So this does a few things for our students. So first, it um, preserves and protects their current GPA um, so that it can't go down. Um, grading during distance learning can be really challenging and can really even be an unfair um, practice because it can oftentimes reflect a student's access to technology, learning materials, and family support more than their actual individual learning. Um, distance learning content and assignments that are being created are different as well. So it's not the same as when our doors were open. We've asked our teachers and our schools to focus on essential learning that helps prepare students for their next courses in school. Um, that means our teachers are working really hard, but by and large, they haven't delivered content in this way before. Grades under these circumstances, um, we feel like they might not accurately reflect a student's progress through our standards. We want to ensure that we're protecting student GPAs from that kind of a challenge. Finally, I also want to share that, you know, Oregon's colleges and universities, as well as colleges and universities across the country, including our Ivy League schools, are temporarily updating their admissions requirements to accept without disadvantaging students a pass, no pass model um, in lieu of letter grades right now. We're seeing many of our Ivy League schools even move to that model. Yale University um, is moving to a pass fail model uh, for their courses, and they are accepting um, students um, progress, noting that many um, school districts around the country have moved to um, some kind of pass incomplete version of, of school. Now, offering grading in some settings or even offering students the choice to receive a grade assumes that that instruction and content is really a match for what's happening when our schools are open. And it's just simply not, it's not the same. And worse, it can perpetuate inequities by giving students access who have access to technology and resources, the advantage of being able to earn a letter grade, while less resource students cannot realistically exercise that same kind of a choice. Director Gill, we're almost out of time, uh, just about 30 seconds, but I wanted to let you have a, a message to students and teachers out there during this time. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I would say to students is that we're here for you. Um, we, we hope that you reach out to your school if you haven't heard from them because they are trying to reach you. Um, they're committed to maintaining that connection to you and your family. Um, and that, that's our goal is to connect with you and, uh, and make sure that we're supporting you in this time. Thank you, Director Gill, for joining us here on Straight Talk. And thank you for watching and listening. Don't forget to download our new podcast. Here's a QR code. It'll take you to a link where you can download our podcast. 
or get it wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for watching. Stay safe, and we'll see you next week for Straight Talk.